she moves into it and there it goes it's high enough it's long enough it's a beauty it's straight between the post the score here now hello and welcome to that's the way it was a program that looks back at the history of rugby league in episode 17 on may the 4th 1920 a man arrives in tumut new south wales to become proprietor of the Wynyard Hotel. With wife Veronica and three young children, the family quickly becomes involved in the social and sporting life of the town. Along the way, he buys an old tin pot. Little does he realise that this old tin pot, the Ma Cup, would play a significant part in the social, economic and sporting life of the Southwest Slopes and the Riverina. To discuss the history of the Mark Cup, we're going to speak to Neil Pollock, who's written a fantastic book called A Social History of Football in Group 9, 1920 to 1971. So, Neil, welcome to That's the Way It Was. Oh, thank you. Neil, what more can you tell us about this fellow, Edward John Ma? Well, for such a famous cup, he was, uh, I guess, not a particular... Uh, a special person. There was a lot of publicans who uh, presented challenge cups to towns to, to play football uh, at that time. He was um, he was from a farming family at uh, from Grant's Corner near Woodstock, which is close to uh, Cowra. Mm-hmm. As a young man, he he bought he developed a farm at Crowther, halfway between Cowra and Young. And these towns would later become Mark Up and, and Group 9 towns. Uh, they said he swapped his, in the war years, he swapped his farm for a hotel at Bendig Murrell, which is in the area. Uh, he only kept that for a year or so, and he moved into the quite uh, huge, big, sumptuous uh, Royal Hotel in Young. He stayed there a couple of years, and then it ended up in Tumut, and that's where he, he donated his Mark Up. He was a... He was a a sporting tragic, I suppose you'd call him now. He was uh-huh. a very, good, he was a very good cricketer, much better at cricket than uh, rugby league or rugby union. But he was a useful centre. He, he could referee, and uh, he was also a useful tennis player. He was a crack shot with a rifle, uh, and he was very interested in horse racing, as most publicans are. Uh, so he was, he was involved in everything. Just, he, was- he, he just. He, he came into Tumut and he just embraced everything and wanted to get involved, you know. Now, the first Mark Cup is played on uh, Wednesday the 14th of July in 1920 and Tumut uh, defeat Gundagai by 27 points to six. But, uh, Neil, this match is played under rugby union rules. The following year, they changed to rugby league. Why, why was that? Uh, why did they change to rugby league? Well, rugby union um, was in 1920. Rugby union was what was played at Tumut and Gundagai in that area. Mm-hmm. They were actually the last to move over from league. What happened? It was uh, just a little history of that, a, a brief history in that area, West Wyalong. Yes, was uh, full of uh, gold miners that could only um, have Sunday off. Uh, took to rugby league in 1911, just three years after it started in Sydney. They were the first team. Over the first town over the mountains to do so, uh-huh. and and they and it sort of radiated out. It went. The, most things come from east west when when you're talking in the country. This one went from west to east. It started from West Wyalong. It moved to um, Barmedman Area Park, Tamora. Then the war came and everything stopped. After the war, June E, uh, in particular, the railway people there took it up, and then. Slowly it came through Cootamundra, Young, Hard and those places, Cara. And it was actually Tumut and Gundagai that were last to move over. And when there was no there was no class conflict the way there was in the city in the bush. The young people, the people coming back from the from the war and the youngsters, they wanted to play rugby league. They just thought it was more exciting. And uh-huh. so the, the officials were very, very happy to to move over to the new code. It was absolutely, uh, absolutely seamless. And rugby okay. union didn't yeah. exist in those towns for another 30 years. Right. So it, would it be fair to say that rugby union virtually sort of 
dies out in this area after uh, after this decision? Absolutely, absolutely. The so only even in the, even in the school, way up in Orange, Bathurst, maybe a little bit in Wagga from time to time, but usually we're related to government institutions. Yes, know? that's what I wanted to ask about the schools. It wasn't played in the schools at all, or. Look, I think the schools, I don't know a lot about exactly what happened with the schools, but I, I think the schools would have went directly over, uh, particularly the Catholic schools embrace rugby league uh, em emphatically. And, you know, a lot of, as you know, I mean, a lot of the great, the major actually, in this area, um, it's, a, it's a relatively high Catholic area compared to most areas of Australia or the state. Yes. And it's a lot of good footballers and it, I think it produced a lot of good footballers because there was a lot of priests with a lot of time uh, and they were very deeply involved with their football clubs. In, in uh, Unlike, you know, Protestant parsons, you know, who uh, yes. only turn up on Sunday uh, for that, sort of, you know, so they were deeply involved. So uh, that was one of the reasons too why I think Group 9 was a very strong uh, rugby league area. And, and Neil... The, the structure of the competition, because the Mark Cup, well, the Mark Cup's described as sort of a challenge cup, but it's not like the English Rugby League Challenge Cup, is it? No, or not like the FA Cup. I was, but no, it's, it's not a knockout uh, competition at all. OK, so typically a businessman, mostly a publican, but it could be a milk bar owner or someone with a, with a shop, um, donates a cup to the club for their town. Mm -hmm. The idea is to get people from other towns, teams from other towns, to come to your town to try to get it off you. And the holder of the cup, the, per the, per the person who's putting the cu cup on, uh, is hosting the, the competition, gets all the gate money, typically. Yeah. Uh, and But you can take the challenge cup away can, and then you, if you win and then you can get challenges yourself. So look, there's a stack of these um, these cups around, uh -huh. and, and it was a time of irregular competition. I think in a way it's a bit like probably if you're like a band member these days. You know, there'd be there'd be a gig this week and maybe one next month, and then one comes out of left field. Someone wants you over there to do yeah. something, and be some home, and there'd be some away. So, but it was before. It was probably quite difficult to get a group of people together to play a game. And I think yes. that's probably why there wasn't. And the distances were fairly great. You had to make a big effort to get from one place to another. Well, this is the other thing, uh, because the this the Mark Cup sort of, well, it, it seems to expand very quickly in the in the 1920s. You know, Cootamundra and uh, Juni, they uh, join in in 1922, and other towns quickly sort of follow. So why was this? Uh, what was the driving force behind this uh, quick expansion of the competition? Kudamundra, Kudamundra uh -huh. is well, in, in, in one word. In, nine, in the first two years, it really laboured. Uh, there was only three, in 20 and 21, the only two and Gundy guy played. They only had played three challenges each year. It was wet winters and people couldn't get to matches. They were a bit of a debacle, some of them. Mm -hmm. and, but Kudamundra, Actually, to explain this, there's, probably, there's four levels of Challenge Cups. There's probably a good background that will explain what happened. The first is, is, is simply between – the lowest level is between simply between various clubs thereabouts in your neighbourhood, and mm -hmm. you put the cup up, someone comes and gets it. The second level, and this is the, the, the level that Ted Ma uh, got onto, was between teams made up of the best players of the various clubs thereabout. The, uh -huh. the, what we call that Tumut versus Gundy guy first match was actually between the Tumut and District Rugby Union and the Southwest Football Union, which came out of Gundy guy. But the Gundy guy team included people from okay. Cool and, and Tumblong and places around. So, so you've got that higher level of performance. The next level is to get the best players from the various clubs thereabouts and then make a t permanent team of them. Because obviously if they're a permanent team, they're going to know each other better and they're going to play better. Yes. And that's pretty much what Kudamundra did. They took it to the next level. Uh -huh. Then they took it to an even higher level. They were a permanent team from the best thereabouts 
and they started importing players from the city and, and, and various other teams around, towns around. So they were going to be the best of the best. So Cootamundra was a bigger town than Tumut and Gundigai, and the businesses got together, they put the money in, they got a coach, and they yeah. were lucky in that they got a very, very good coach. But um, I think you pointed out that the – Railway lines played a big part in this expansion as well. Uh, the reason why it was uh, it moved, was able to expand so quickly. The railway lines, the fact that uh, uh, there was a very good railway system. Yeah, exactly. The railway system probably also kept the, the markup going uh, for a long time, where if it had a good road system and the distance wasn't so great, it might have died out a bit earlier. But, yeah, Kutamundra, very significant town on the main southern line, which is, you know, the busiest railway line um, between cities in Australia. Yeah. Uh, connected to Sydney and Melbourne. So there was three towns, Hud and Murrumburra was on that line, Juni and uh, and Cooter and also Wagga further down. Uh, yeah. So they were all on that line. The, all the, bran the branch lines to the northwest, to West Wyalong and Tamora, and Arm Edmund, et cetera, came out of uh, Cootamundra and also to the south to Gundagai and Tumut. So they were really in the centre of the southwest, of um, right. the southwest area. So it was easy to get to Cootamundra. And actually people didn't mind going to Cootamundra because it was a big town. There was lots on there uh, compared to uh, Tumut and Gundagai, which at that time were much quieter places. And I suppose, was there any sort of like, uh, uh, economic benefits for hosting these games. I imagine, you know, uh, when these uh, Mark Cup uh, challenges are on, you know, that uh, people are visiting the town, so the p hotels and cafes, restaurants, etc. there's a bit of a boost for them when, uh, when the matches are being played. Yeah, now the matches were played on Wednesday afternoons because in the, in the uh, bush it was a half-day holiday on Wednesday. Shops stayed open late into the night, actually, uh, in, on Saturdays. Um, uh -huh. Because in the old days, people on the horse and buggy, they come to town and want a big day of it and they wanted the whole day to muck around and it took a long time to get to town anyway. Um, so Wednesday was sort of put aside as for, for people who worked in shops and businesses, they could have the afternoon off because they had a, this extra work on Saturday. So, so on these Wednesdays, you yes. can get up to a thousand people coming to your town on, you know, on special trains and, and in, you know, on trucks and motor motorbikes and w bicycles and whatever they cars, whatever they came in. So were there? It was, were a, there... It was a massive amount of money that came into the pubs and to yeah. the milk bars, and also they made a lot of money off the um, off the trains. So if you could get you, you would you give a guarantee to the railways, which might cover like in a steam train, say two hundred people coming. If you made a, if you got a thousand people on the trains, well, that's all your profit. So often they made a lot more money on the trains than what they did through the gate. Uh huh. Okay. 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 All right. Well, there's uh, there's another trend uh, that we see very early on in the Mark Cup, uh, and you mentioned this just before, and that is that some of the towns they start to import players. Uh, from Sydney. Now, this is yeah. at a time here where, you know, these days, uh, of course, it's all one way. It's all country guys going to the to the uh, city. But uh, back in these days, players would come from Sydney to play in the Mark Cup. And the first to do it, as you mentioned, there was Cootamundra. They bring a halfback from Glebe called uh, Phil Reagan to town. Yeah. Yeah, Reagan was... Um He'd been playing uh, with uh, Glebe since 1910. He uh, uh -huh. started even in rugby union. Um, he was an interesting guy, and in that he was—they called him Wombo, and I think because he looked like a wombat, he was very short and, and thick set. Yes. He um, he was he was injured very badly in the First World War, and they say that um, he had a shrapnel in his thigh. And sometimes on a football field, he'd start bleeding from his thigh because that shrapnel was getting irritated. Right. Uh, now, he's a, 
was a rugged sort of character. So he came out there. It was amazing, actually. I think I don't think anyone coached continuously for so long as he did. He came out for six years, and yeah. uh, he developed. When he first came, he looked around at the team, and that and they were they were quite an old lot. And then there was a, there was a group of young boys, 18, 19 year olds, who'd been yep. playing, and he, he put most of them in the team. And and he had a, a, a centre at that time. Uh, he later became a five eight called Eric Weissel. Uh, and they right. had the Tom Tom McDevitt. They had Brian O'Connor. There's some really wonderful young athletes, really, and uh, they were fast. And you know they suited rugby league because it was a much faster game. Well, the, the older the older guys in the other team were more, you know, in the, yes, in the yes. ruck sort of rugby union people. So, yeah. and, he, and, you know, he had a fitness regime. He had something that didn't happen that much in the in the, the serious yeah. training regime. He was a smart, smart cookie and he was a great tactician. So he, he made that team quite marvellous. And they didn't really import many other players. Um, right. They just relied mostly on locals. Uh, it, yeah, uh, six years later, then more and more imports came in, particularly as the depression hit, because uh, city players were cheap at that time. People, people well, this is it. Job in the city, they could they could get bread and bed and board out at, at a country pub, and they might get a little bit of a job and get paid two or three quid a week, and that was better than starving in in the slums of Sydney, you know. And a lot a lot okay. of those guys who came out, you know. They from Glebe and Newtown, uh, Redfern. They were from pretty hard places. To go out to the country, have a bit of fresh air, do a bit of fishing, you know, nice girls, yes. you know, quite attractive, really. Well, this is it, uh, Neil. I mean, because uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of players start to come from uh, uh, the Sydney competition to play in the the Mark Cup. Uh, you could say there's sort of like a galaxy of stars over the history of the competition. Uh, come down to play in the Mar Cup, so I don't know, and we can't mention all of them. But could you give us a few examples of the the guys from Sydney that came down to play in the competition? Yeah, well, uh, Chuck. Fro- I mean, people who are listening to this, I, I, I'm assuming most people will have a good knowledge of the, you know, of the people in uh, rugby league history. I mean, Chuck Fraser came from Balmain. Yeah. Uh, he was 18 years old as a, as a as a kangaroo in 1910 or nine, I think. He came out to Gundy Guy and won the and helped them with uh, that. Um, yeah, there's so many of these guys. Uh, there, oh, no. was, there was Whip Ladder came out. Um, Latcham Robinson. Um, I haven't got a list in front of me of a lot of the a lot of the great coaches weren't. Some of them weren't really known in Sydney. There was a guy called Teddy Taplin, who was who who, who was everywhere he went. He he had the Midas touch and uh, he, he a great coach. But I think he came from Camden. He might have been in Sydney for a while. But there was a lot of people who didn't really engage so much with the city, but were still very good. But, and as you said earlier, there a Cootamundra. Well, they do dominate uh, the early years of the Mark Cup. Uh, and it's not just through the efforts of uh, Phil Reagan. You mentioned there early the the Weissel, Eric Weissel and the Weissel family, they play a significant part uh, in Cootamundra's success, don't they? Yeah, oh, look, Weissel, Weissel was the draw card. Uh-huh. Like thousands of people, both 20, 26 or 27 thousands of people would come pretty much to see Weissel play. I mean, people out there have told me that, you know, they're, their parents have said that people in the city don't appreciate how wise it was because you saw his best when he was 21, 22 out there, uh, you know, on country paddocks, and they were quite pri- they were privileged to so Yeah, Weissel, um was ex- was extraordinary, and uh, look, he came from an extraordinary family. Uh, there was a, I think it was the eleventh, it was the eleventh child, yeah. and, and uh, all of them except one, I think. Uh, were great sportsmen. The one that wasn't a great sportsman married a, a, a train driver who used to uh, take the take the people to the Mark Cup Caps and do, and do the cockadoodle do whenever someone uh, 
won a won the mark up from you know a challenge was successful but they they all go home in the train and go cock a doodle doo all the way down so everyone knew that they they, they were victorious but uh, now his his father was quite extraordinary he was uh, an acrobat he used to uh, have this trick of riding a horse and then he'd jump off the horse and then bounce on one side and then then go over the other side and bounce off the other side and bouncing you know back and forth over the horse and then he'd take the horse over uh, a jump and instead of being on the back of the horse while he's jumping the horse he used to jump it going beside the horse okay, okay. and he was and he was actually banned from the, the he was a railway worker and he was banned from the the railway uh, athletic competition uh, because he won it every year so it got boring so now right. his father was extraordinary his mother was a was a champion runner in her teens but you know in those that she married at 20 had 11 children but you know yes. that's all is um is is one of his sisters played uh, cricket against an english team uh okay. and Russell was a, a great cricketer too he uh yeah he was one of those people who's Fame for uh, bowling uh, Donald Bradman out somewhere or other. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But this is another, I suppose, Neil, you could say this is another characteristic of this competition. And that uh, is that uh, sort of particular families play a big part in the history of some of these uh, at, uh, country towns. Uh, uh, you know, can you give us an, uh, some examples there of some of the families that sort of dominated the uh, rugby league towns it, 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 through this period yeah well uh, yes oh, well, there's a lot of them there uh, probably yeah. the boards were the biggest uh, uh, as a dynasty there were three generations of them uh, in west wylong uh, that'd be for me some of them would be familiar to people uh, used to uh, sydney football because some played with penrith um, but the, you know the, the broads broads were there right at the start of football in 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 the area they were and they were a tough lot they were the most involved in uh, gravel work road construction and all that stuff yep. and uh, uh, and i must say a lot of these families were were tough the halls at young were another one and they were they had similar sort of uh, occupations but the broads and the, and the pinnies they were they were two families they both they had legs in both west wyalong and tomorrow and uh I think there were 17 different broads. If we added them up and then who they married, they're in their cousins and all that. Um, you know, two of the broad uh, daughters in the 40s married two coaches who came into town. So they obviously w would have produced some good footballers. Um, all right, all right. And then there was uh, actually one of the most important ones were the Lawrences of Barm Edmund. Uh, they, okay. they, they, they were they were quite a v very important uh, family, and, and without uh, the Lawrences, there would be no Barb Edmund football team. The, the, the history. Right. Well, not yeah, there. I'm glad. Yeah, okay. I'm glad you bring up Barb Edmund because this is another thing about the Mark Cup. Uh, uh, it wasn't just the big towns like uh, Cootamundra that uh, dominate the competition. And uh, will you highlight uh, the performance of one of the smaller towns, Barb Edmund? They won the Mark Cup in 1929. Yeah. But um, Edmund always uh, rose above its normal standard when it uh, ever since the Mark Cup was going to be around. Actually, there's a bit of a history of, of, of relatively small places in rugby league that sort of pushed against, push, pushed, you know, above yeah. the weight. I, I think a Hannah's, Hannah's Bridge, I think a lot of people remember that that team. And the Manjurama Reds were another one. Um and Manjurama Reds supplied a lot of footballers to places like Canoundra and, and Cowra in later uh -huh. days. But look, but most of the, these towns had a population of three, four, five thousand people, but Bar Medman never had more than about 600 people. Um, but they drew their border quite wide and they were close to the um, Australian Rules Rugby League border, a bit of a fuzzy border out there. But yeah. And around the border, people used to play uh, Aussie rules. So many people did this. They used to play Aussie rules on, on Saturday and rugby league on Sunday. So the barmen would often reach out to Area Park, Park, which became a very much an Aussie rules place, and get get um, players from out there to, to play for them. 
and they also were always in dispute with uh, West Wylong and Grenfell, the two neighbours about, you know, um, the, those Wylong and Grenfell were always upset because Barm Edmund, because I don't know, I think because they had a nice family atmosphere, they were able to attract people who were much closer to those other towns to come and play for them. Okay. But they were built. They were built around farming. There was all wheat farming there. The, the farming, the Lawrences, Coopers, and Templemans families were the were the first were the, the three families, and they were sort of almost the core. They had two interesting players who played for more than twenty years for the Mar Cup. Right. They were, they were brothers-in-law called Rusty Gorham and uh, Cole Quinlan. Uh, his mates used to call Quinlan Guts. Uh, off the field, they were sort of typical, quiet, shy, pleasant wheat farmers. But on the paddock, they were probably the most feared men in uh, in rugby. <laughs> <laughs> Mark up right. rugby. Okay. Uh, but they were so tough and they just kept going and they knew all the tricks uh, of what to do in the scrums. Um but Barm Evan also probably, look, definitely owed its success to to John uh, Lawrence, uh, sort of the patriarch of the Lawrence family, yep. who owned a great deal of the property in town and had money to put in, and a couple of extraordinary administrators, uh, Artie Kelly and Bruce Maitland. Uh, Maitland would later become the the the, the president, the, 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 the boss, the president of Group Nine. But right. they were just an example of how you can be bigger than you seem through like. Community solidarity and strong leadership. At at, at Bar Medman, everything was about the Mark Cup. You know, the, the sort of social life centred about it. If you you're a school teacher and you came into town, they would be trying to suss you out to see, well, how good a footballer is he? Can we put him yes. in the whatever? You know. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Now, uh, uh, Neil, in the I suppose in the history of the Mark Cup, well. The history of the Mark Cup, I suppose you could say, is also a history of disputes. Uh, we could do a whole program, I think, on the disputes that uh, take place throughout the uh, competition. But in 1933, uh, we have a dispute there that, uh, well, has a very big impact on the uh, administration of rugby league in New South Wales. And it starts after Tamora. Uh, Tamora successfully defend the title they won in 1932. Tamora uh, won the Mark Cup in 1932 and they defended a year later when they defeat, uh, and I suppose we'll say defeat in inverted commas here, uh, they defeat West Wylong by 21 points to two. But uh, then a dispute starts about this result. Can you briefly just explain what happens uh, here, Neil? Well, if that, there's a 33 dispute, middle of the Depression, so everyone's yep. desperate for money. Tomorrow, I rehired their, their 1932 um, coach, a halfback from Brisbane called Harry Thompson. So yep. Thompson arrives in town nine days before the Mark Cup match. Now, the Mark Cup and Group 9 rules have got say that you've got to be resident in the town for 28 days, and that's good reason. Otherwise, people would be just importing people at short notice willy-nilly. Yep. Now, the New South Wales rugby league decided, well, it's a depression. We've got all these guys in the city who are really suffering. We're going to relax our rules and we'll allow people to go to the country and play. Uh, only, only got to give seven days' notice. Now, uh-huh. West Wylong had protested before the match and uh, and and told Tamora they are going to protest. And and, um, and so Tamora contacted the New South Wales rugby league secretary, Horry Miller, and Horry sends back and said, yeah, no, no, no problem. You can play this guy. I don't know how he said he could play this guy too because the guy comes from Brisbane. I don't see how the New South Wales Rugby League has jurisdiction over yes. Brisbane. But anyway, so Group 9 and uh, Kuta Mundra, who controlled the, all the cup proceedings at the time, they clearly disagreed. It was a lay down the there to them. Uh, Tamora had broken the rules. Uh, West Wylong got the cup. So then Wylong had... A big crowd that came, and they, def- they they were holding the cup, and a big crowd from Young came across, and they had a very successful day, and they won it again. But Tamora appealed to the New South Wales Rugby League, which had absolutely no idea what to do. So they decided, in their wisdom, not to make any decision. I said, well, let's have a replay. Okay. But they didn't say where the replay was going to be. And, of course, that was a huge dispute. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's going to be a tomorrow, going to be a West one, there's going to be a neutral. Who's going to get all the money from all the people who come coming to town for this replay? And everyone wants to see the replay, you'll get three or four thousand people. So anyway, a, a big crowd turned. West Wylan got it in the end, in the, yeah. the replay. So they came out there, uh, and then what happened? It was a draw. The replay was a draw. So the <laughs> Mark Cup rules is that if you have a draw, the holder keeps the cup. You have yes. To, but who was the holder? No one could work out who the holder was. So then they decided, well, we better have another replay. So they put it at Bar Medman, which is halfway between uh, tomorrow and West Wyalong, and so three thousand people came to Bar Medman. Got three little pubs. It would have been a great day for the for the publicans of Bar Medman. Tomorrow finally we found the cup. But from West Wyalong's point of view, they lo- they'd lost this match as you said, twenty one to two. Then they got three more matches. They got six or seven thousand people coming to matches, plus a whole lot of other money coming through the businesses, and they were laughing. And it just showed that the New South Wales Rugby League was more of a hindrance than a help, really. Because, uh, well, at this stage, uh, at this stage, the New South Wales, it's virtually, I suppose you could say the Sydney clubs uh, virtually control country rugby league. But, uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, this is where uh, uh, this uh, dispute becomes significant, doesn't it? Because uh, um, uh, a fellow called Fred Cahill, who's very influential, I understand, in the area at the time, he... uh, well, he started to make uh, rumblings about uh, this control that the Sydney clubs have over country rugby league, doesn't he? Yeah, well, uh, people out in the southwest would say that NSW in NSW rugby league stands for Newcastle, Sydney, Wollongong. Right. So <laughs> they think the sun sets in the blue mountains. So that was that was their view of the of the New South Wales rugby league. I mean, they were upset about Fred Carr was a, at that time was a a writer for the Young Witness newspaper, and yep. you know a lot of the a lot of the, I didn't sort of mention this earlier, but a lot of the popularity and the, and the drama around the, the market was driven by the newspapers, you know, because they, they wanted to yes. make a big story of this. And the more disputes there was, the, the more the newspapers were happy to sort of be, make them make them. Be. Fred Carr later became uh, the member, uh, minister in the go- government and, uh, and the member for, um, for Young between 1940 yeah. and 1970. So he, but uh, at that time, he was in in rugby league administration. He was a very forthright, argumentative sort of guy. But he, he sort of started the, the country rugby league to be a separate president. Their big complaint, well, I'll tell you what, typical of a complaint was around Weissel. Now, tomorrow's got a markup match. They're going to get 5,000 people in. New South yes. Wales Rugby League says that weissel has got to go and play for New South Wales at some match. Now, what does the New South Wales Rugby League give tomorrow for the loss of all the revenue for that? Absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, and, the, and then they just sort of think, oh, we're not sure who should be in this team, so we'll have a probables and possibles thing so everyone goes down to melbourne for what a lot of people would say complete waste of time why don't you just come out and have a look at these players and make some decisions so and then city teams would come out mm-hmm. uh want 50 percent of the gate or more you know and so they weren't getting a good deal if if, if when uh, when when country people went down to city they just the new south Wales rugby league thought that they should be just thankful for being chosen to go there Yes. <laughs> Whilst if people came from the city to the country, you know, they'd want to be re- compensated for it. So, yeah. yeah. So it was, in the end, I think the co- the country rugby league, because it was still based in Sydney, ended up just being a vassal of the uh, of the of New South Wales rugby league. I think it ended oh. up being a bit, bit of a useless organisation. All right, all right, okay. Well, the country rugby league did run for quite a while there, you know, from 1934 when he set it up uh, through to, well, it's only just recently again been dissolved uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, uh, it did take control of uh, 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 rugby league matters in the country there. So uh, that was a significant uh, uh, point in uh, 
the administration of the game, I think, in uh, New South Wales. Ch Neil, there's another major development uh, in 1938 because uh, there's a radio station in Young, radio station 2LF, and they start to broadcast rugby league matches. Uh, they start to cover the Mark Cup. Uh, the first callers are uh, a pa a Pat Barton and Bill Allen. But, Neil, this is, again, uh, this must have been a tremendous sort of boost for the competition. Well, yeah, the, the clubs didn't like it initially because they thought that the, the numbers coming through the gates had gone down because people uh -huh. to listen to it on radio. But, uh, look, it, it opened up a whole new market, I think, you know. I mean, my mother, for example, she... Um, she didn't like rugby league men that much. She thought they were a rough lot and she didn't like pubs and stuff like that. But when she listened to the John O'Reilly, who did the um, the commentating of the Mark Huff, she just loved his voice. And he was, uh, and she, you know, we were all used to sit there and listen to, to the to the rugby league and uh, had a nice afternoon. So he, he was a, he was a special, special character. But obviously, you know, in the distances involved, most people who wanted to come to, to go to a football match couldn't get there, you know, because yeah. um, you know it's such a broad area. You're talking about 150 miles from the top and the top of the bottom and east west in in that Group Nine area. So now and he was a. I mean, I think a lot of the people listening to this will know of John O'Reilly. I mean, he became when he was in on into on to LF from 1946 to 1960. He came to Sydney, worked for the ABC. Um, he did you know, Commonwealth Games and he, he did lots of boxing. He did all sorts of things. He, he, could, he had a very clear voice. Um, he was a qualified referee and he had a really deep understanding of the game. Um, and he was just brilliant at creating word pictures. He described everything in great detail and uh, often from a very difficult position because they just st – it wasn't as if they were high up in a stand. Most of these um, – Grounds didn't even have grandstands. Yes. Uh, they'd be sitting on a table beside on the sideline, and during the parts of the match, if people got excited, there'd be people standing in front of the table. Um, yes. I remember one. There was someone said at one match, you know, they, they couldn't see all the people that were sitting at the table couldn't see, so they they all stood on top of the table, and then the table collapsed. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, okay. That was hard, and, you know. And, and, I've got a picture of some two LF people, uh, you know, in the snow, sitting there in the snow, yeah. all rugged up outside. You know, there was no glass in front of you or anything like. But yes. and he never, he was the sort of man who didn't, he didn't opinionate about everything. He didn't give a, he just described what was going on, uh, and he just uh, was very, very good at what he did. Um, yes, it's a very like, different, you know, kind, very different sort of commentator to what you get uh, in the present day. Uh, John O'Reilly, and he did, he was a very famous rugby league caller here. He called the rugby league for the ABC for, well, a very long time. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, yeah. yeah so Another, another uh, great broadcaster out there was Bill Carney, who had a menswear shop. He, he was a coach of Young. He was probably one of the greatest players ever, Carney, and he, he, he stayed in Young all his life, or well, since he came there when he was 18. Um, but but he was he was a, he was also a voice. He had his own show on Monday evenings where he'd review all the all the programs, and, and that was very popular. Okay. He used to have run-ins with Jim Sullivan of the Gundagai Independent. When the Gundagai Independent was sort of the the bible of sports of rugby league journalism, in that. and more people bought the Gundagai Independent in its day than lived in Gundagai because people just loved to read it for what Jim Sullivan was going to say about football. But he used to have a few run-ins with him, and I think it was be, it was sort of the old media and the new media that, you know, Jim uh -huh. said, listen to Bill Carney. Bill Carney be saying, how come he's he, he's announcing the referees for Saturday, and my secretary doesn't even know who the referee is going to be. He's announcing on the radio. So it was this tension between the the newspapers that were king in the past and the and the radio that was becoming the more immediate sort of media. So uh, yes. media uh, wars have been going on forever, I think. Yeah. Now, uh, during the Second World War, uh, or part of the Second World War, the competition is suspended. But uh, after the war, uh, the competition picks up very quickly. And, Neil, would you say that the 1950s was a bit of a uh, sort of a golden period for the Mark Cup? Uh, we see, well... We see some very big crowds. 
Uh, there's a number of very good teams. Gundagai in the early 50s there, Young had a very good team during the middle of the 50s and at the end of the 50s, uh, Hard Marabaran. Uh, uh, had a very good team. Uh, so was this sort of a golden period during the 50s, do you think? Yeah, that was. There was a lot of money around. Um, 1928, 29 was very, very big crowds or into 30. Um, yep. there was, and again, probably because there was money around at the end of the 20s and it all dissipated. Uh, after the Second World War, you know, there was in early 50s, the Korean War, there was, you know, that was a war was a pound to pound. Uh, and there'd been a an unbelievably good run of of seasons, you know. Out yes. there, you know, it's a drought or flood, but they had good seasons, good prices. Things were good in turn economically in the early fifties, so that encouraged people to uh, to buy players basically uh, and to spend money on football. But um, and also just after, same as the First World War, after the after the Second World War, everyone wanted to see to play football or watch football or. I think they're just rebuilding community, you know. Yeah. Um, and Cooter were sort of set the ball rolling in a way. They they got a marvelous coach in Herb Narbo. Um, yes. Who, you know, he was a very very fit man. He he was well into his late thirties when he came. To, he was thirty four actually when he came to Cooter. Um, he, he was a great coach and developed a team. All of locals. And they won the Clayton Cup for you know being the the best team in the in in their group in the in the state yes. uh, in nineteen four and, and uh, yeah he handed over to a teacher called Bob Hobbs uh, who sort of was a good um, disciple of Narbo and they said uh, I suppose that's what the really good coaches do they actually set up uh, an apparatus and a, and a philosophy and a way of, uh, of teaching of training people at football and then others follow them and so. Cooter had a very, very good team for a few years. And then Tumut, uh, they had a non-playing local coach called Jim Jeffrey, who was quite a genius, and he took them to the Clayton Cup in 1949. So the standard was very high um, for them to win those. Uh, okay. those and uh, Gundy Guy then had this amazing 24 Mark Cup run in the early 1950s. And there was a... Grazier there called Stanley Byrne Crow, who seemed to be the driver of their success, and he he imported uh, a couple of top players in uh, international, Neville Hand and Bill Edwards, a uh, lock. Uh, uh -huh. And for some reason, uh, I'm not sure if they pull strings, but Gundy Guy had uh, an uncanny ability to attract teachers to their schools that seemed to be incredibly good at football. Uh, right. There was John Biscaya, Paul Butts, Ralph Bryant, and Harry Gibbs all came out, and they sort of featured in in champion teams. And they they were sort of started. Gundy guys started importing players too. They had Jack Plater from North Sydney, Bill Longhurst from Newtown, Ron Batty from Balmain, and a centre who was from Barm Edmund, but a marvellous centre, Wally Towers. They they brought all those into the fifty two team. They won twenty four matches in a row. Um, and uh, and then Young got on the ball wagon and they bandwagon and they um, they actually imported thirteen paid players. So right. in fifty-five, a typical Young team might have one or two locals in it. Uh, ten of those were from Sydney. Uh, all of them, you know, were first grade players, with one exception. It was a South Sydney junior player called Dougie Cameron. Who was probably the best of the lot, actually. Um, right. So, uh, but young, they had a. I think they were largely uh, assisted by another grazier, uh, Ted Dwyer, who uh, had a big property, and he supported them. And then another team came along that uh, surprisingly took over and had a run of 29 markup matches in the 1950s, and that was Harden Murrumburra. Yep. Now in 1954, when Gundy Guy and Cooter and Young were buying in all these imports. Um, Hard Marabara gave up. They said, well, "This is too hard. We can't compete against these people because we're not willing to spend a lot of money, you know, forming a team. We just want to play local football with locals." And Schumann had pulled out too. So, but uh, one of their players who, who retired and became the secretary, uh, his name was Les Lee or Dutchy Lee, everyone called him. Um, he had a really good committee organised and he set out to build a team. 
Yeah. Um, that they could win the Mar Cup. And he got Harry Melville from uh, the second row from St George, who played in the grand 56 grand final to come out. And like Herb Narbo, he sort of set, set the pace and set the style. And then they won a lot of matches. And then Matt Grenfell, who was like a lot of players who came up there, was from Wollongong yeah. and also a champion surfer of all things. But he, they were marvellous leaders and, and could have won those 29 Mark Cup matches in a row. Um, that was a real high point. No, no one – and look, in those days – in, in 1946, they changed the markup day from Wednesday to to Saturday because that uh-huh. half-day holiday thing was a bit of an aberration. That was, you know, old old thing you did in the country way back and you didn't well, – when every, everyone wanted everything standardised. So yeah. that dropped. But so you'd have to play your markup on Saturday and play your group nine competition match on on Sundays. since Ever since 1938, there'd been still a, a Group 9 competition, you know, the round-robin regular yeah, yeah. competition that we know. Uh, but it never, it wasn't until the early 1960s that it actually be, could be seen to be on a par with the marker. But but that Harden team had three wonderful players who probably kept, uh, Bernie Nevin, who was an extraordinary goalkeeper, kicker, kicker from Newtown, uh, Roly Nagus, Kevin Nagus from uh, from Cowra, and Eric Kuhn, who still lives in uh, Harden now, from who who came from Bar Um They were great players, and they were the colonel of that time. But right. that was a rare a rare team in that you know there was just so much talent, and a lot of the talent were just local guys who blossomed. All right. Um, so Neil, uh, I just wanted to explain. Uh, well, this is particularly for overseas listeners uh, there, that the New South Wales Country Rugby League competitions, they're uh, organised into various groups. Uh, okay, these groups represent uh, different regions and uh, and over time, uh, the boundaries of these groups do change. Uh, but uh, in the 1960s, we start to see some... Uh, dissatisfaction, I suppose you'd say, with the boundaries of the Group 9 competition. And and the markup is uh, largely centred around teams in the uh, Group 9 competition and the adjoining Group 20 competition. So, well, Neil, could you just explain what these complaints uh, were about these boundaries? Because, uh, again, this does have a big impact, not just on the markup, but on the Country Rugby League as well. Yeah. Um, so- Group nine and the markup became synonymous. You, over time, you had you had to be uh, in group nine to play the markup. Okay. And, uh, there was okay. So group be, be good if people had a map in front of them. But yeah. if, if the group nine um, covered an area that went from uh, West Wyalong down to Tumut, a very long, elongated. Uh, Length uh, is a long way, and uh, yes. something like uh, about 120 miles, I think, to yes. from, from Tumut to West Wyalong. Might be quite that far, but look, it took hours to get there. And Group 20, which is further to the west, and was centred on the MI had the MIA and Wagga in it, the Murrumbidgee Irrigation Towns and Wagga, yes. and that sort of stretched from Griffith up the top down to Batlow. Uh, now to go for, and Batlow was twenty miles from Tumut, so people from Batlow would get would spend you know three or four hours to get to Griffith when they could get to Tumut in you know fifteen minutes, twenty yes. minutes, and so it was it grew up illogically, but because a majority of the people in Group Twenty from the MIA towns they didn't want to change it, they didn't want to lose Wagga and those other places, and the major most of the power in Group Nine was in the northern part of Group 9, and they didn't want to lose the towns around Wagga. But they had this idea around Wagga of this perfect group. Uh, and when they couldn't get any satisfaction from Group 9 or Group 20 to form this perfect group, they went to Sydney um, to talk to the CR, the Country Rugby League, and they kicked them out of the room. They said, we don't, we, we, we haven't, they said, we haven't got some, some solicitors come from Group 9, I think it was, and said, you haven't got an authority to deal with this, and they agreed with that conclusion. So they just threw them out, and then they saw red. They got upset, and they just formed a rebel group, uh, which had 
It had Tumbarumba, Batlow, Tumut, Gundy Guy and Junee, which are all ex-Group 9 towns, and yes. three, three Wagga towns. It, it was called the... It was called the Mur. They called it the Murrumbidgee Rugby League, didn't this rebel group? This rebel group was called the Murrumbidgee Rugby League. Yeah, the, Mur the Murrumbidgee like group. And there were other things that they were complaining about. One was the transfer system, which weakened. Again, that's something the Country Rugby League approved. God knows why. Uh, whether it actually weakened um, country teams because they couldn't afford to buy any city players anymore. Because uh -huh. uh, they got very expensive. And, you know, there was a, then the other way, you know, and the uh, the other thing that was massive in the city was the poker machines that built the big clubs. And obviously, well, you could argue maybe that in the 1920s, it was Group 9 that cap made, made, cap made football into capitalism. Uh, now it was completely the other way around. Uh, yes. The, but um, also Australian rules was growing, particularly in Wagga. It was sort of taking over, you know, the... Uh, not that it would worry me. I mean, if, if a kid can can kick a ball around and have fun, and who cares what code they play? But you know, for the administrators of the code, they were very worried that uh, that uh, and because the, the VFL, and particularly South Melbourne, which had sort of that was their territory to get players for their feeder area, they yeah. uh, they put a lot of money in, so they were under threat from from the transfer system, from Australian rules. And from a really uh, dodgy geographical uh, area. Yeah. And also, and what, did this, what did it do to the Mar Cup? Uh, what impact uh, was on it? Killed the was Mar Cup, there... really. It killed the Mar Cup. I mean, uh, the the teams in the MRL, Gundy Guy, Tumut, and Junee, which were quite critical to the Mar Cup. You know, they had all the tradition. Uh, they couldn't play for it because they were in they were they were ostracized yeah. in the other group. Um, and, but they didn't care because they, they were doing well. Their crowds were better than ever. They didn't have to. They, it was a lot cheaper to go from one town to another. Uh, they had look. They mightn't have been able to get people the trip because they were outside the system. People yeah. might be reluctant to go and play there because you, you'd be a pariah. But they got to good players from. They got a great coach at Juni from uh, Mike Sullivan from from Britain, and they got a lot of coaches from New Zealand. I went to Wagga, very good players. So they were laughing, really. Yes. But the, the, the Group 9 was really broken up at that time. And when they all got back together in 1969 and settled differences, yeah. Group 9 became the MRL, or the MRL became the Group 9. So the Group 9 just moved south. Um, West Wyalong, right up the north, moved moved to Group 20, which was the MIA teams. Yep. It really suited them in the long run. They, they grumbled a little bit, but I think it suited them because that was closer for them. Um, Young and and Kudamundra actually went to the MRL after the first year. Um, so the Group 9, was, and Young was added to Group 9 and Harden and Tamora. They were, anyway, they all ended up in this new Group 9 which is pretty much the MRL plus a couple of other teams. And uh, it all settled down. It was fine. But the, the Mark Cup had died by then. It, it, look, it would have had a natural death anyway. It's just amazing that a Challenge Cup that you had to play for on the weekend in which you'd also have a competition match yes. um, lasted so long. I mean, how many people would be keen enough to do that? Yes. Two, two really hard rugby league matches in a, on a weekend. I mean, yeah. I would have thought that when Wednesday um, shopping, the, the Wednesday half day holiday finished in 1946, uh, well, a lot of people predicted that would be the death knell of the markup, but uh, it, it lasted another 25 years. And the final markup was in 1971, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that was uh, Young held it at the time, and there was a coach called John Hobby who uh, is. Is extraordinarily revered in, in Tumut today, and still today, um, who created a marvellous team at Tumut in that year. Tumut hadn't challenged for the Mar Cup for five years, or six years it was, uh, you know, the cup that they thought was their cup, and you look at the Mar Cup and it says presented to the Tumut and District Rugby Union, so they sort of think it's their cup. Okay. Um, so when, uh, when tomorrow... As when Tumut came to, to Young to to challenge, you know, everyone thought 
well, they're just coming to take, they'll win. They're just coming to take it home. We won't see it again. And that's basically what happened. They, they took it home, they put it in the RSL club in a glass case. Um, the RSL club got into financial difficulties a few years ago and it ended up going down to the New South Wales uh, Rugby League Museum down at Moore Park. And All then, right, yeah, because the Mark Cup, uh, uh, the, the old tin pot, uh, I mean, the, the trophy itself has got a bit of a history, hasn't it? Because wasn't it lost at one stage or it was stolen at one stage? Well, I know a bit of everything happened to it. It's, it's yes. actually now in the, back in, in Tumut, actually, 2018, I think it came back. It's in the Tumut Bowling Club, the sports club there in Tumut, if anyone wants to look at it. It's very nicely presented and it comes out. Uh, if you've got a reunion or something like that, they lend it out as part of the, the stipulation of what should happen with it. Um, but, yeah, look, it was – it had to be locked in uh, bank vaults at times or in police stations. Uh, and people t- took umbrage about things in relation to protests. Uh, at one time it was stuffed under a culvert uh, just out near the showground at Young. But, oh, look, I think that might have been just some young newspaper cadets doing that on a quiet news day, actually, when I went on right. that. <laughs> but uh, – you know, and people say there's always these things about it. it had a lid and where's the lid? And, you know, some people say there was some someone crushed it with a tractor or they they threw the they threw the cup in the Tumut River and they lost the lid. But in reality, it never did have a lid. Um, so people just used to make up lots of yeah. It, it's a wonderful thing of people making up wonderful stories to mark up. Uh, um, at the I'm sort of collecting these things and put them at the back of the book uh, under a little little thing called anecdotes, which are things right. that think, well, they're probably not true, but at least they're, they're entertaining. And, well, the Mark Cup had a bit of a revival uh, earlier this year, I understand. There was a revival match between uh, Tumut and Gundagai earlier this year. Yeah, well, they, they played two matches. Um, yeah. So the first one at, at Tumut, and COVID stopped me going to the second one. But, um, it, yeah, they brought it out really to... Uh, for the centenary of the of rugby league in those two towns, because uh-huh. started in 1921, so that, yep. so so they brought it out and they they just made a thing of the Mark Cup, which is nice, you know, to to have that. Uh, Do you think it could be revived? Do you think the competition could ever be revived? You know, on a full scale level. Look, a, look, a lot of people seem to have a lot of ideas about that, but I don't know. I think it it belongs it belongs to its own era. And it's got its own history. It may not be a good idea to do anything with it, really. There, there was another cup, the Eric Weissel uh, Cup. It was a magnificent cup that Tamora put into play, I think, in 1932 or something like that, pretty much in direct competition to the Mark Cup, and it didn't quite succeed, but it was popular enough for a while. But when that sort of faded, no one was interested in it anymore. They made it into the uh, under-18s um, Cup for whoever won the under-18 premiership, and that's still yeah. going. So, you know, maybe you could do something like that. But, oh, look, I, I think it's, it's it's too much identified with that era, a different era. It just should just be what it was. Don't, not, don't try to make it something else. That's the way it was, the history of the Mar Cup. My name's Rob Corra. On behalf of Neil Pollock, this program was recorded in the studios of Undercover Music, Your producer is Adriano Aldemar. Until next time, may the force be with you. 